the objective of this uh, webinar is basically to talk uh, through some of the key concepts and approaches towards budget advocacy with a focus on key populations. Uh, and uh, uh, as in, in, in the Eurasian Harm Reduction Association has recently developed a guide on budget advocacy, which is really focused on uh, key affected populations in order to help activists from this, those community groups to advocate for domestic funding. And we will be covering some of the content from this uh, guide, uh, as well as providing some of the additional, some additional information about how to use it. I wanted to start this presentation by talking about New Year and Christmas. It's those recent celebrations, <laughs> we still remember those, I guess. And I want to wish you all of you Merry uh, Christmas and Happy New Year. Yeah. And I want to also mention that many, many governments spend lots of money on celebration of New Year and Christmas. Um, those expenditures are really nice because they decorate cities nicely, give presents to some groups of people, uh, etc. But generally, the, those, the, those expenditures come from local budgets and some of the procurement mechanisms which are employed, uh, or employed during those spendings would be very intransparent. Uh, talking from the experience of for Georgia, a country where I'm from, and by having a, a brief look up about exp on expenditures of some other countries in ECA region. I can tell you that uh, generally procurement for New Year celebrations are done at home. Like uh, everybody knows that New Year is a certain day of the year which is which uh, which does not change. It comes every year but nevertheless most of the preparation done by local governments in terms of spending monies are done at home. Like there's no time left for proper tendering procedures, etc. There are a number of uh, services procured which are non-competitive, uh, meaning that there will be again no tenders, but sole source procurement. Those includes uh, artworks such as uh, work of musicians, more work, work of designers, etc. And uh, also it is quite big in most of those procurements who would eventually benefit like understanding of what would be the benefit of it. Uh, uh, for, for this webinar, basically I have looked up on New Year's pending for in George, in George capital of Georgia, Tbilisi, uh, to, to uh, demonstrate how very simplistic budget analysis which I employed can help uh, uh, community activists to start their advocacy processes. So this is what I found about Georgia, and this will be short introduction before we move to more concept to the process to the process of budget advocacy in our region. For uh, for this year, 2000, 2019, uh, Georgia made uh, two major spendings for New Year celebration. Uh, the first was uh, 1.7 million Georgian lares, uh, which were, uh, and those, this money was spent outside of tender, ten, outside, without tendering procedures. I was really lucky that Georgian municipal government has a strong opposition party who actually published most of those data because it is extremely difficult to trace expenditures when they are done at local level. Now, at central level, budget reports are uh, published in number of uh, publicly available reports. Information about municipal spending is by its nature is still public information, but not regularly published. And this is a case in many countries. Unless you, you get basically lucky to know that something like that happened, it is very difficult to trace uh, those procurements. A uh, second line of procurement was done through formal tenders and George Tbilisi municipal government has spent 1.2 million lares on uh, buying technical support for New Year celebration processes. It's including like stage designers, uh, some audio companies, etc. 
overall, this if we also one George Morris maybe something that I'm familiar in the group only. So if we actually actually convert this to dollars, it's one point one million dollars. It's not a lot of uh, a lot of money, but for a small country like Georgia, it is a substantial amount of money. And uh, if we convert further this, this amount to calculate uh, who were potential beneficiaries, like citizens, uh, like residents of the Tbilisi area, and then it turns out that the government spending was approximately one dollar per capita. Uh, this is uh, 95 cents, basically. Uh, not, not, notably, the Tbilisi municipal government spends nothing on key affected populations. Uh, there are different groups of key affected populations, but um, it is estimated that 35,000 individuals who also belong to key affected populations reside in Georgia and municipal uh, spending for services for those groups of population who are mostly very vulnerable and mostly uh, experienced number of social and health problems is, is zero. If we assume that Georgian municipal government who could afford to spend 95 cents for per capita for New Year, New Year celebration could afford the same amount of spending per capita for all the key affected population, uh, this would amount 30, 33,000 uh, US dollars, uh, dollars for key affected population. Uh, by having such calculation, those figures would be valid only for Georgia, but by making and following the logic of this calculation, it is easy to generate some amount of money which could be advocated for. Mm, so, it is, since municipal government can spend certain amount of money for public celebration, it can also spend the same amount of money for per capita, meaning for uh, for uh, public public for such a public good as delivered public health services for key affected population. Uh, so this uh, if this argument has ten, definitely the thirty three thousand dollars so is not much, uh, but nevertheless it is very different from current level of spending, which is zero. Could buy lots of goods for individuals uh, who need those services a lot. This could be. HIV prevention package annual, which costs which costs about twenty four dollars annually, and this is very much an average figure of um, different packages available for different key affected populations. It could have bought a uh, housing or shelter shelter for about um, ten to fifteen bed facilities for the same groups. Then there's currently no, no no shelter for any of key affected populations. So lots of public goods can actually could have been actually generated from the same amount of money. Definitely, it is it is impossible and hard to actually advocate that New Year celebration were cancelled in any country and the money diverted to any of the um, public health issues. But nevertheless, advocacy for diverting same similar per capita spending to some of the public benefits uh, could have been stronger. Uh, so. Shortage for funding is very tangible issue for countries in ECA region. Uh, but when it comes to budget advocacy, it is a process to influence public uh, influence allocation of public resources. Very often, countries don't see uh, in ECA region where services is largely funded by international donors. They do not see government, have not really seen governments as a, as a as an agency to to advocate as an agency to which they need to advocate for funding however many of the processes and changes in our, in this region have caused more uh, civil society organizations to focus more on domestic funding domestic funding is the only sustainable way to fund any of interventions for key affected populations and in this guide actually we discuss a lot about harm reduction uh, and uh, this this is a novelty novel approach speaking to government and advocating to government on how to change its allocation um, uh, Mm, definitely, uh, the end of uh, end of budget advocacy work is that there is uh, 
uh, more funding that goes to the services that benefit the beneficiaries. However, actual budget advocacy work can include different types of uh, processes and activities in which civil society organization activists can engage. One of this type of work is uh, building budget expertise. Uh, this means uh, increasing capacity of civil society activists, organizations, community members, even international organizations and public servants in budgeting processes. It is very common that even public officials in many countries can lack uh, sufficient understanding of budgeting processes and how things work. Especially this is true when advocacy is done at local level where municipal government could not be well aware of some of the uh, mechanisms to actually request more funding, program more, program, uh, develop more programs and advocate for more allocation from the central government uh, if that's a source of funding that which they use. Uh, definitely increasing expertise among civil society activists is very essential. Budget documents are generally somewhat complex and uh, the process is also seems to be very technical in which only some, some economists or public financing specialists engaged. Uh, and uh, many civil society activists actually avoid working with, with, uh, with budgets. They avoid doing costing exercise, they avoid engaging in discussions about budget issues, uh, which, which somewhat diminishes their, diminishes their role as civil society activists. Um, there's uh, very often people tend to uh, avoid discussions with public officials when when those discussions lead lead to talks about money uh, because they feel that they do not have sufficient information to argue against government officials. Therefore, actually generating this capacity among civil society activists is very essential. We will talk later that no, actually no government decision will be uh, will be effective unless there's a budget allocated towards this decision. Therefore, in speaking with budget figures and uh, supporting your ideas and opinions with budget figures is very important. Another part of budget advocacy work, which is just similarly as important as building the expertise and capacity, is analytical work. As, as I said, budgets could be com complicated documents to read. Those are generally like a few hundred page long documents, which also change. So it's not like you, first of January, you sit and read those 400 documents, you understand everything, and this knowledge would be true for the for one year. It's, it's a continuous work which one has to engage uh, basically every day and every moment, uh, therefore developing some uh, tools and approaches uh, to deduct the figures which are, in, which are relevant and interesting for one's advocacy work is very essential, especially when we talk about services like HIV prevention or harm, harm reduction. Those are generally very small portion of public spending and uh, publicly approved and published budgetary documents do not really include any figures that will uh, directly give us an information about uh, HIV related spending or spending for certain services. Uh, information contained in those documents would be aggregated. Uh, analytical work done by civil society and organization which would include requesting relevant public information, analyzing it regularly and publishing already, the publishing already digested pieces of information like figures where the funding has decreased, increased, etc. changed, somehow allocation has changed, somehow, somehow can significantly help uh, this organization as well as other organizations working in the field. Many of activists who engaged in uh, maybe some campaigning processes will have uh, no time or competence or willingness to do such, uh, such type of work themselves. However, they can use this re ready-made, digested pieces of information to support their advocacy messages. 
collecting and sharing best practices in the field of budget advocacy is very, also very important. This is extremely inspirational. A lot of times we will see that there's, a, there's certainly a need of extra by, uh, additional allocation from budget or change in the budgetary allocation. However, and this need is understood and seen by the local uh, um, community-based organization or civil society organization. Um, however, there is little known about the, uh, how to approach those issues, like just by going to visit public officials, etc. how to approach this. However, even in eco regions, there are a number of already existing success stories uh, on how number of community-based organizations has managed to change allocation, public allocations, and advocate for more, more budgetary allocations for harm reduction services or other services. And therefore, sharing this, this experience not only inspires people by telling them, yes, this is doable, but also actually gives some ready-made re recipes uh, uh, how to approach certain, certain issues. Improving accountability is, is very major piece of, um, piece of budget advocacy, budget advocacy uh, um, work. Uh, on accountability issues, there are a number of organizations who actually provide a uh, very significant input on public public budget and public accountability work. Therefore, as this work could be done in partnerships with uh, large and already well-established civil society organizations. Mm, and most of those are presented in all of, all of countries in ICA and uh, the civil society organizations working with key affected populations can actually partner with those. Uh, no, with those, those processes. And later on the slides, we will see some of the data and findings for uh, regional surveys on public accountability. Uh, one aspect which is important on public accountability, and I've mentioned this earlier, is since uh, spending on harm reduction or HIV prevention services is such a small share of public budget that those, uh, this information is hardly ever available in documents which are routinely published as a part of budgeting process like quarterly reports, midterm mid reports, etc. Those information gets generally aggregated. So if we, if we are lucky to just see, for example, expenditures related to HIV, and of course HIV is not the only issue that we're interested in, um, definitely uh, this, is, this is good luck. But seeing what's, what's underneath, is extremely difficult. In, in, for example, to analyze how much money has gone to service provisions through public organization versus civil society organization. This information never gets published. However, by its nature, this is a public information. And if we consider that this information is so essential in our work, that it, we can actually start advocating, maybe not in uh, general budget reports, but uh, in some specific, for example, uh, line ministry reports to have a designated section which will provide routinely this type of information. We can definitely get this information by sending and requesting officially public information, but when the information becomes routinely available, this on one hand is this focuses, uh, attention of public system, govern, governance, government agencies and public sector providers on that specific aspect of service provision and highlights the importance of it. And on the other hand, we also sort of save, save ourselves effort and time to actually write the letters, um, wait for answers, et cetera, et cetera. So the process just becomes really easy and more smooth. Finally, an important aspect of budget advocacy work is support which civil society organizations can provide to budget authorities. Uh, this, uh, in this case, civil society organizations act like experts 
Uh, by actually knowing more about service provision or types of standards which should be adhered and uh, support budget authorities or executive branches of government in drafting, for example, pieces of legislation, regulatory documents, designing programs, developing costing tools or other implementation instruments. This is something that many in many eco countries organizations are engaged in. And uh, for example, as I can say from, uh, from my perspective, like being from Georgia, civil society organizations have been in public activists actually have been engaged in uh, legislative uh, development of legislative pieces, as well as program designs and actually standards for service provision have been uh, drafted uh, with and by civil society organizations but those were not approved. That's an unfortunate part of helping public sector sometimes. Uh, why we need budget advocacy? So basically why we need domestic funding? Uh, this question is just as simple. So budget advocacy may be some elusive term, but it's basically money coming from our own budgets. It's from the perspective of the countries who, who uh, who have been receiving international aid to cover those services. Uh, this, question, this question is becomes uh, more intriguing. Uh, on one hand, we need uh, public budget advocacy and the allocation of public money because public money is definitely our money and it should be spent for the services which we considered are important for public. Now, the guide actually talks, uh, provides some details what constitutes and how public budgets are constituted uh, and definitely the money which, which account, which uh, creates this pool of public budget are the money paid by us, citizens, as taxes, and other non tax revenue, and different other revenues of public sector, which is again against the good, good and money of, of, of the citizens of that country, and definitely borrowings, which country can can borrow internationally or domestically and those loans are actually to be paid by us so it's an action and therefore we definitely have a say on how to allocate this money and this uh, execution of this right is very important part of part of our work maybe it is easier actually to seek funding for if we have a small project maybe it would be easier to seek funding from international uh, organization um, maybe some private corporation maybe like local private corporations but nevertheless having our own government spending money for our own needs is uh, is a substantial substantial and very important way for sustaining those services now, uh, without budget, no decision, political or policy level decision or legal decision will be implemented. Uh, if we look at the constitutions of any country, somewhere in this constitution we will read the line that every citizen has an access, has a right to, to health or government pledges to provide health care for all the citizens and to protect their rights, etc., etc. However, we all know that a uh, number of individuals who belong to key affected populations will not have access to any health care. Their health rights will not be protected, neither will their other human rights. Uh, therefore, uh, yes, Constitution is the highest uh, 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 is, is, uh, is on the top of the doc ranking of legal documents in the country, but nevertheless, many of the clauses of the constitution will not be materialized. And this materialization of those rights is directly tied to having respective budget allocation available in public budget. 
And definitely there is no such thing as free. So no one has, no country can ensure materialization of health rights without any spending. So it cannot be free, it needs spending. Um, and budget is basically a demonstration of public commitment, co commitment of the, gov of the elected government of the country uh, that they, commi they commit to, to the execution of certain principles. Um, spending money does not really mean that um, purchases made would be good. So we, we all have experienced a scenario when we have walked in a store and spent money and bought absolutely useless thing. Uh, government also may also behave like that. So basically government also has a pool of public funds which could be spending uh, in a ways which are not not best possible ways or are simply unacceptable. Uh, we, uh, this is our second webinar for today and the first webinar which we had uh, today was for Russian speaking population and one of the participants had uh, said that uh, for years they have advocated for staff positions of community mobilizations, mobilizer, mobilizers within uh, local HIV centers and their advocacy efforts have been successful. So those positions have been allocated and funding salary basically for those positions also allocated. However, that means that no community member is now employed on this position and actually community members are no longer engaged in service provision. So yes, the money was spent and purchases were made, but those purchases are not, are not the things that we have desired initially. So therefore, budget advocacy actually is a process in which we influence those allocations and try to change them in a way and in a design that is suitable for our needs. So if we want services for, let's say, um, IDUs, if we want harm reduction services, there should be a services which are also provided by peers. Uh, definitely having just a salaried position somewhere in aid center does not mean that there is, there is a peer-driven service provision. But budget advocacy is a difficult process. Budget advocacy, it, had, it has not been invented for harm reduction or HIV, and this has a very long history around the world in terms of how civil societies have actually uh, managed to advocate for pro-poor, pro-gender pro sensitive budgets, etc. But working with key affected populations has its own difficulties. And those difficulties are very deep rooted and very hard to be overcome. Uh, this is a high level of criminalization, stigmatization and the discrimination of individuals who belong to, uh, to those groups. Uh, it is very hard to actually advocate for a need when, can, when government's position is that this individual is a criminal. When government says that this individual actually for the behavior, for that certain behavior should be put in prison, it is very hard to advocate for the needs of those individuals. And therefore it is even more essential to actually conduct such a, such a process. Stigmatization and decriminalization also means that there will be very little supporters for our advocacy process. Not only public officials might have a mindset which is not supportive to our ideas, but also in terms of communities which we can mobilize to support this idea, the number would be, would be limited, including within members of the community as well as uh, members of the society in a broader sense. So there will be basically less support. Just to put it really like, uh, harsh, really, maybe very, not a very best uh, best example, but nevertheless, if we advocate for the needs of children with leukemia, it is, it is, is no one will say that children with leukemia are are bad or we don't need to advocate for them. But if you advocate for a drug user, this is a different story and different difficulties. Um, we said earlier that many countries in ICA are receiving funding from, are actually funding uh, HIV prevention services using uh, international funds. 
and transition from donor which donors which is happening much more faster than domestic governments are actually stepping in in the process of providing those services to individuals as something that that is experienced negatively by, by many of the countries many countries are still in transition process and hopefully will manage to successfully conduct their budget advocacy work and uh, ensure public allocations aspect of budget advocacy work is very uh, different is becoming difficult because of corruption many countries in which corruption is a major issue uh, not only information about budget allocation will be hidden uh, but actually there could be uh, threats of other different types of barriers for budget advocacy work. Allocation, pub ensuring public allocation is not just that you got you you get some certain amount of money in a budget, which says let's say this is for harm reduction, but also ensuring that this money is spent effectively and in a corrupt way, meaning that it will deliver services to to the end users and beneficiaries and corruption is something that could definitely hinder this process uh, by diverting these resources to uh, certain favor favorable service delivery modalities um, many countries in ICA are uh, emerging economies which also means that there's a lack of transparency in their uh, in their budgets I will a uh, little bit skip towards next slide to, sh to show you the findings of uh, open budget index survey uh, this is 2017 data open budget survey is conducted by annually um, and at least uh, sort of uh, level of openness of budget information. My country, Georgia, is on top of this list, and this is just a selection of countries. Um, uh, it, Georgia is on top of the list, but as you, if you go down the list, you would see that uh, the budget openness can dramatic, can drastically actually decrease by countries. Um, this shows, even if we look at the sort of uh, Western countries like Germany, France, etc., budget openness cannot in those countries is also not very close to 100%. So the process could be pretty close, and definitely the lack of transparency significantly hinders budget advocacy work. It makes the process much more lengthy, and even could, could be impossible to. Transparency, transparency aspect is more important when it comes to public procurement processes. Uh, procurement or the way how money will be spent is uh, one of the key aspects of budget advocacy work and uh, in transparency of uh, public spending is something that is very hard to tackle. Uh, there is another challenge associated with budget advocacy work, which is a natural discon disconnect between the efforts and the results. Unfortunately, as with many other, other advocacy work, uh, the fact that you start advo advocacy, let's say, in, in January and you finish your activities in December does not mean that in next year, Jan January budget will actually contain a line which will say, let's say, harm reduction budget. This, is, this does not really happen like that and the process is very much is very complicated. Actually, you can be successful in one of your efforts and uh, I'll advocate and successful, successfully advocate for, for a budget for one tender for civil society organizations on harm reduction services, but nevertheless this, could, this might not be sustainable, this could be just one year long contract and it will disappear by the end of the year. And when it comes to the advocacy process at central government level, this process is much more lengthy and will would be hard to imagine that it actually so successfully and directly leads to, leads to budget, uh, to public allocations. 
Mm, and therefore, this natural disconnect, which occurs be be between activities and results, on one hand could be discouraging, and on the other hand, could be uh, could be constrained to constraint constraint during planning any of budget advocacy works. Many of budget advocacy projects nowadays in ECO region will also receive some so some type of support in the face of grants. Those grants could be small, big, etc. And Global Fund provides grants for that. Uh, uh, and it is it is a challenge for those grants to actually see this uh, to demonstrate this direct linkage between activities and the results. I've seen some of the reports which um, try to show those, those this process. However, it is very, it is actually to very difficult to say that those relationships are causal. And definitely an important challenge in budget advocacy work is lack of experience and knowledge among civil society organizations and among community-based organizations. It's not like those people have, we gather people in civil society organizations or community organizations by their professions, like by judging of oh, your, your economist, your public finance expert, etc. good. So, we don't collect, we don't, community organizations naturally are not professionally driven organizations who will include people who have certain professional backgrounds. They might uh, by chance have people who, who have certain expertise. However, the whole idea of community organization is not to have a bunch of economists sitting around or a bunch of public finance or public management specialists sitting around. Therefore, it will include lots of people who are very much motivated, but probably have never seen public budget at all, or never really bothered to under, never really understood how how public budget is adopted or formulated. And gaining this new knowledge is is a challenge, and it requires not only efforts in terms of self-education, but also experience. Um, for, I think, over the past few years, uh, which I've been engaged in at some level in budget advocacy work in courage, uh, I've seen a number and number of workshops which have been carried out about budget advocacy. I've attended some myself, even um, taught on some of those courses. Um, and I realized that uh, people get some information which is a pretty, you know, pretty general, uh, but what, what is lacking is an actual utilization of this information and switching general information, transforming general information into experience. So many people have received some courses about budget advocacy work, but they have never done but actual budget advocacy work themselves, or they do not really perceive this as a budget advocacy no, advocacy work. Uh, we, tend, we tend to provide lots of uh, general information and we tend to also feel ourselves more or less generally aware of the situation, but we ten, tend to uh, refrain from making actual steps toward towards uh, transforming this general information into experience, which is very important. You have to really work with actual uh, budget figures in order to understand how those works and how can those, those be used. You have to work with uh, key stakeholders in order to understand how to work with those key stakeholders. If you have never worked with a parliament, you'd, you will never really uh, understand you you can read the books about it but you will never really know how to approach a parliamentarian to advocate for your own ideas and uh, this is again data from open budget survey and this shows like how limited the experience is with the civil society organization in engagement with budgeting processes um, as we saw in budget openness uh, a slide. Georgia was was the first. So basically, Georgia provided the most opportunities to be engaged in budgetary processes. However, as a matter of fact, other countries, Kyrgyz Republic, is actually 
uh, has the best score in terms of public society engagement in budgeting processes. So just the fact that you have a supporting and more supporting environment does not really mean that you're actually engaged in this process. So maybe you have more information, but making steps towards transforming information to, to action, this is something that mm, uh, many of us uh, experience problem with. And in general, this slide actually, this data actually shows how limited civil society engagement is in our, in our region. And this is again budget, uh, open budget survey. And to move towards how we start our budget advocacy work. Um, in, in the uh, guide for budget advocacy, which, uh, which we've designed, uh, the number of steps suggested for budget advocacy work. And the first step is uh, we've basically broken down this uh, system into four, four basic steps. First step is uh, about understanding general environment in which public budgets operates. Uh, many of us will need knowledge and basic basic knowledge and information about uh, how government how go how government structures are built and what are the roles of uh, each of the government structures. For example, if we want to advocate for uh, for uh, if country is not funding harm reduction services and we want to advocate for having a harm reduction program, we, we generally start to start this process with executive branch, branch of government, which will include uh, line ministries, or um, we can start with uh, uh, fellow parliament with some friendly parliamentarians, but actually use those parliamentarians to approach executive branches of the government, because function of executive branch branch of government ministry is to actually develop a design a program. This is not a function of legislative or per se parliament parliamentarians. Uh, another important aspect which we need to understand is how health systems in our country functions, and this is definitely. True in our region because most of the countries in our region understands uh, HIV prevention, harm reduction, and those services as a part of healthcare domain. So it will be part of health health services by its nature. Largely, the services which are included into let's say H let's say harm reduction by its nature, those services are not medical. And when health uh, systems are approached to provide funding for harm reduction. Um, it is very difficult to advocate for, for funding for the services who have no medical nature. Uh, largely, most of those services would be social services, legal services, etc., etc., non-medical non type of services. Uh, therefore, understanding of health systems in our country helps to find more appropriate placeholders or understanding of how other systems function so that could, we, could, uh, we could ensure uh, proper having proper advocacy targets. Important part is also the um, policy, policy processes on universal healthcare coverage, which is now being uptaken by a number of uh, countries in ECA region, uh, as it is uh, promoted as, as a rational and efficient approach to, uh, to organization of uh, health systems in health systems uh, and advocacy for certain services, for example, harm reduction within universal healthcare, healthcare agenda poses its own challenges as well as its own opportunities and those could be exploited appropriately. We should definitely understand how legal system in our country functions and because budget advocacy process, by the fact that budget is, is a law, it requires a legal, there's a legal process around uh, creation and execution and monitoring of the budget. But besides this, there are a number of uh, legislative uh, processes which can help our budget advocacy purposes. For example, uh, 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 arguing about human rights issues or certain rights uh, going to court with those arguments is an important part and definitely such a down-to-earth issues like 
uh, requesting public information and how to argue when this public information was not provided or a government refused to provide it. Those also require some um, experience uh, on how to work with legal, legal system. Uh, knowing some of the international policies, could, relevant ones, could be also very helpful. Uh, for example, I've already mentioned the approach towards universal healthcare, but there are other, uh, other policy aspects and international agreements which can support us. For example, for Ukraine and for Georgia, for Moldova, those could be EU accession processes that can be used uh, in advocacy process. For many countries, it could be some of the like trade unions and other cross-border unions, which could actually influence the price of pharmacy price and the availability of pharmaceuticals in those countries. So this uh, document will also have an, uh, have an important influence on our budget advocacy work. Definitely uh, important part of this process is to build partnership with other civil society organization and community-based organization. Budget uh, advocacy work is not the work that is carried out by a single individual. It's a, it's a very comprehensive uh, work. And uh, if we take community organizations organizations in our region who work with key affected population, uh, definitely there are more stronger and larger civil society actors in many of our countries and partnering with those organizations does give an important leverage in terms of achieving uh, our objectives. Uh, step two in budget advocacy process is learning about budgets. Uh, budgets, budgets are extensive and complex documents and many of us uh, do, do believe that it should be worked by some finance people, uh, maybe not by me but by some other guy uh, who's, who's majored in economics, let's say. Uh, but definitely those complex and extensive documents can be demystified and this this should be, uh, and in any country, budget has a very clear structure, uh, which with some efforts could be easily understood. So uh, by opening our national budget and routinely and regularly looking up the same information, for example, allocation for HIV AIDS in our country, and tracing this information from year to year, from quarter to quarter to observe changes if budget has been amended, is an important process. Budget document, besides, besides, let's say we are only interested if we are only interested in HIV spending, but a budget does give information which is very relevant for any advocacy work. This is uh, this is basically it's a document which which approves budget for one fiscal year, but also stipulates budget prospects for generally more than one year, three to four year, year period in, in, our, in most of the countries in our region. It will say how much, what is expected revenue or income level no, for the government for the coming years. If government is expecting dramatic increase in revenues, definitely it seems like a good point or a good time to advocate. But if government is experiencing, uh, is expecting a, a decrease in revenues, maybe it's not a good time for advoc advocating for new, alloc new funds, so, and maybe then advocacy process should be, uh, should be focused uh, on, um, uh, on actually increasing internal efficiency, inter in changing internally allocation and increasing internal efficiencies. It is important to understand what is government's vision and uh, forecast about sources of revenues. If government is planning half of its budget uh, using borrowings, it is a different story. But if uh, government expectation is that Look, uh, revenues from local taxes will be increasing dramatically. It is a different story, and those information can also help us target our advocacy efforts. 
And the third important piece of section of budget definitely talks about what the government, how governments will spend those money, what would be the priorities, and how, how much money will be allocated for each of those priorities. And this is a very important piece for us to plan our advocacy efforts. Uh, step three is uh, is uh, for us to understand budget cycle. Um, budget 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 cycles in most of the countries uh, budget cycles are very much the same in most of the countries. They even follow the same calendar. Uh, budget cycle is 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 non-stop and like is an annual process, but it's also a non-stop process. Uh, for example, budget cycle we tend, we decided to present it in this four-step model, which starts with budget formulation. Is uh, this is a process when executive branch of the government actually draws a plan together uh, to. Uh, um, to construct the budget. This process, uh, the, on one hand, this process uh, finishes, this process generally finishes sometimes in uh, August, September. Uh, the budget calendar will strictly say on which date, but this does not mean that the moment that calendar defines that budget formulation is uh, sort of finished and budget is submitted for to a legislative branch of the government for approval, that budget formulation process actually stops. If budget formulation process is pretty much an ongoing process which has certain benchmarks on which certain documents are generated, developed, Developed, published, made public, enacted, etc. But nevertheless, the process is very much ongoing. Budget formulation is done on, on fiscal basis for one year period as well as for long term period, three or four years in most of the countries in our region. As we said, budget is a law by its nature, therefore, it needs a legislative branch of the government to approve it. The situation would be would be somewhat different uh, when we talk about local budgets, and therefore it is very important to differentiate processes of central budgeting processes with local budgeting processes. Those would have uh, calendars which which would be slightly different from each other, and this. Uh, Mm, two calendars, this, this needs to be very clearly understood uh, by activists. Execution is a process which starts after budget uh, enactment and includes uh, implementation of, of the priorities and activities which are stipulated in the budget. So when budget is formulated by executive branch of the government for enactment, it is transferred to legislative branch of the government, while execution again happens to happens by executive government. Uh, budget budgeting process has uh, has an oversight and evaluation uh, step also, uh, which is partly carried out by executive branches of government, and there could be an organs which are outside of executive branches of government, like in some countries this would be an auditor's office, which would be an independent body, but would be different from country to country. Uh, the important aspect of this four-step model to understand that on one hand it is linked to a calendar which means that there are dates and periods where each of these steps is extremely uh, intensified but nevertheless it is like continues a non-stop model. A second aspect which is important to understand in budget cycle process is that when you intervene in one of one of those steps, you will have special objectives and targets and documents which you want to influence. But nevertheless, your influence should be seen even successful in, for example, at enactment process, you should actually see that this is an executed and when executed it is, there is a proper evaluation of this execution going on and then this idea is 
taken up in next budget formulation cycle. Um, so this provides an activist some of the, uh, this can help activists actually to develop timeline for for the budget advocacy work and see what are specific activities which they should be doing on each of um, each of those steps. And I want to specifically focus on oversight and evaluation part. Oversight as the whole budgeting process oversight and evaluation part is very much it is this those steps do not need us community activists or society organizations those steps are written down in the law and there are agencies and organs who do it they perform it independent of the fact we exist or not however since we exist <laughs> we want to find our spot in each of those steps and uh, oversight and evaluation is something that is active, that is carried out by, by any government organizations, but actually findings of this process could be very much irrelevant to, to, to our objectives and can provide very little to no information uh, that we could use. Therefore, actually advocacy for changing uh, or altering the oversight and evaluation system in, so that it, it is directly and directed and provides information relevant for our beneficiaries is important. And secondly, this is carrying out, carrying out uh, some of the studies by ourselves independently in order uh, like developing shadow reports, developing other tools which we use for monitoring and evaluation is very important because no matter how things can go in our country, the whole idea is that beneficiaries with communities with which we represent, which we are members of, get whatever, whatever, whatever they need to. So their needs are seen and heard by uh, by public commitments. Uh, four steps, step which, uh, which is proposed in the guide as well as logically follows after we get to ourselves all educated is actually to act upon our knowledge. And this is about finding points for intervention and then actually intervening into these processes. As we said, by looking at this rounding thing, which is used as a background of this slide, budget is a cyclic process and it has very strict calendar attached to it. So there are just very strict dates, deadlines, how this process goes. And looking at this calendar, on one way, yes, we plan our efforts continuously, but on the other hand, we know which is which point of intervention is most important. And this is what the four steps is about. In the budget formulation process, uh, this is a proposal for, which was developed largely for harm reduction services, but could be applied to, uh, to other services as well. Uh, at budget formulation process, uh, our objective is to make sure that needs of uh, key affected population or IDUs are actually become actually policy priorities. Uh, stakeholders could be different from country to country, but in uh, case of ICA, this could include the country coordination mechanism because still still considering that funding is largely dependent on global fund uh, who also gives money in some countries via budgets uh, it's ministry of health and ministry of parliament it could be parliamentarians and uh, the placeholder of our efforts documents which we want to influence and change in this process is a set of uh, strategic documents like health policy, if country has national HIV program, strategic plan, etc. We want, we want to influence those documents so that there are clauses which say that harm reduction should be funded in country or people with uh, um, 
HIV should be provided uh, free antiretroviral treatment, so such things should be written. There should be a strategic, strategic, strategic level, policy level documents, which, uh, which actually have a placeholder to, for those priorities. Uh, those are programmatic documents and guidelines which we want to influence. Definitely, if this is a RV treatment, we want to make sure that uh, uh, there's a even clinical guideline says the treatment starts as soon as there is a diagnosis, and uh, we don't wait for viral loads to go up. Uh, programmatic documents will stipulate issues like how many needles and syringes are distributed per individuals and you would see national documents which will say that uh, individual is only eligible to 70 or 100 or 120 uh, uh, syringes per year, well, if the individual, which means that if individual is injecting, uh, injecting certain substance which needs more syringes, so this individual is basically has to go and buy or share needles. Mm, yeah, and the natural placeholder in this process is draft of draft budget documentation, which is prepared by executive governments for approval uh, to by for approval by legislative governments. Now, some of the input which uh, we can have in this process is uh, actually developing a budget esti estimations, like how much money will be needed. For example, the HIV national strategy generally con contains a budget, uh, which contains budget estimation, how much country will need to achieve X, X level of coverage. Uh, it includes development of costing tools. If we talk about establishing needle and syringe programs, um, how much money, how much would be the unit cost of, let's say, serving one individual or opening one center, or etc. Um, it actually uh, another tool is developing guidelines and standards for services, um, and some of the. Um, uh, part of this work which can benefit uh, some of the work which can benefit this process is actually having ready-made horror stories uh, from our region uh, when transition was not complete successfully uh, and uh, there was like a sp spread of HIV among uh, among population which, which was before that contained. Those are really unfortunate and sad stories and just to make sure that our very own country avoids such, such happenings. Second step is uh, budget enactment. This is when budget is already formulated, aggregated, so every line ministry formulates a budget, it becomes aggregated budget and is submitted by the Ministry of Finance to a legislative branch of the government. This could be uh, Parliament, Senate, I don't know, countries might have different names for those organs of governments. Uh, for us, the objective is that if we achieved on a formulation process, that fund, if we achieve that there is a funding allocation uh, for uh, for our advocacy objectives, that this funding allocation gets actually approved, so it's not lost. So, if uh, someone promised us from the let's say Ministry of Health that they will allocate money for harm reduction, we got to see that this allocation has ended up in in the budget which became approved. This is a difficult part to see that because as we said that budget which is approved by the parliament is generally aggregated and it is very difficult to see in this aggregated budget that uh, something that you advocated for is, is inside the budget. However, the stakeholders and budget enactment process uh, could change. So this could be, this becomes in countries where it's parliament, parliament members of parliament. Um, this members of parliament can ask questions and demand information from executive or government branch on whether certain services are considered and um, included in this. Political parties, if we manage to have some friendly political parties who support certain ideas for which we advocated, advocating could be very active and those uh, 
political parties generally have more experience uh, in working within parliament, parliament and within parliamentarian hearings than maybe some civil society organizations. Uh, Prime Minister, Minister of Health and Minister of Finance again. And definitely uh, we as a civil society actor should should try to attend uh, those hearings if it's possible. Uh, uh, in large countries, it could be very difficult, but in some countries, but in most, but there's a there's always a process to attend it, and if possible, we should really make an effort to be presented there and to voice out our arguments or use parliamentarians and political parties or unions to voice out some of the arguments uh, which we uh, wanna. Uh, which we want to highlight, even if it's even if the allocation which we demanded is not included in the budget, it is still important to uh, share this information loudly because parliamentarian hearings are often recorded and heard by uh, and transmitted on television, radio, etc. Some document which we want to influence in this process or placeholder for our advocacy efforts is basically budget documentation. So I want to see that budget contains a priority uh, and allocation for, for, for the things which we advocate for. Uh, tools which we can use in this process is partnerships. We can develop analytical notes actually to provide parliamentarians if, uh, for example, recently uh, Eurasian Harm Reduction Association has conducted a very uh, important uh, study which was cost of criminalization. Uh, so basically when, um, if we as an activist might not be successful in advocating uh, for uh, shifting spending from punitive system into more humanistic system, which would be from Ministry of Interior to Ministry of Health, uh, by providing such analytical notes to parliamentarians who can speak up about those processes and use these figures and data during parliament, the parliamentarian, parliamentarian of budget. That could be a very important piece of information which we could deliver. Uh, as we said, it is important for us ourselves to participate in budget hearings, just for experience, as well as to voicing out important, um, important ideas. And we can, we can actually gain access to a number of media representatives in this process. Um, budgetary hearings are, are, uh, are one of the most significant aspects of Parliament's work, and uh, therefore. Um, there will be media representatives there who who try to uh, hi highlight to try to find highlights in these lengthy documents and providing some of the information uh, to media representatives could also help our budget advocacy work. The second step of budget 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 cycle, as we said, budget cycle has its own natural. Legally approved, legally approved cycle, which does not really need our existence as a civil society activist to to work. So if uh, if there is no Leila in Georgia next uh, tomorrow, budget cycle will just go by itself. It does not need me. So it's it's very true for other activists. So therefore, it is important to actually target and schedule our intervention to this process. It's it like school, it's it's like seasons of year change nature. So budgets also sort of goes on this process but without us. So we need to find how to intervene there. And budget execution is something that starts from the moment of budget approval. And so basically from first of January until December 30, 30 31st it's a budget execution process. The periods when budget execution process becomes ex extremely intense, for example, when budget is approved, there's a start of new procurements, but definitely this whole year, it will be a budget execution process. And it is 
again, very important. If we have successfully, let's say, advocated for harm reduction program to be included in the budget and it was successfully passed by parliament and it is included, then we actually look that this is implemented and this implementation is effective. Um, budget execution is, is, is a long process because it is, goes from it goes uh, for one year and it has uh, more stakeholders and uh, more points for intervention actually um, uh, we want in, in this process our objective is to enhance outcomes of the budget expenditures if we say there's hundred thousand allocated for harm reduction and all of those hundred thousand is spent on printing uh, information material and leaflets maybe this is not not something that we had in mind when we started this advocacy process uh, uh, so definitely there's there's very major role of civil society actors to be involved there uh, stakeholders uh, with which we work in this process are budget users. Budget user is a new organization which which implements a budget program. That would be, for example, Biden Aid Center, Neurology Center. Uh, you know, it, we, we would be very lucky if it's community-based organizations who implement those services, etc. And those, those are definitely some of the agencies who do the performance like public procurement agencies. Those could be single, this could be a single agency or multiple agencies, depending on the design of the countries. Uh, budget execution placeholder for our work is definitely a budget who, which was enacted and it's written in red budget which was amended. As a matter of fact, budgets change throughout the year. And this process is somewhat difficult to be traced because we said that budget is a law, which means that changes in the budget is also a legislative process, so should be approved by the parliament, but many countries have clauses which allow um, some level of budgetary changes to be undertaken without parliament, parliament's approval. Uh, amendment is is a good thing and a bad thing. Um, it is a bad thing when, for example, uh, government decides this, decides that our harm reduction program, which we advocated, oh my God, this cannot be procured, and it is amended, and this hundred thousand which we advocated for suddenly becomes ten thousand because they have deficit in in other line. So this is a bad amendment. But there are good amendments too because in many cases there could be lots of uh, let's call those savings in in the budget and our execution process. For example, if public if government has budgeted uh, three million for buying certain drugs and after end of this tender there's uh, there's a, there's a save, let's call it saving. There's an economy of $1 million. This is, this, this needs to, budget needs to be amended and this is something that could, could advocate for. Um, uh, from my experience, I know that Ukraine has been extremely successful actually to use uh, amendments as a part of their budget advocacy effort. So they basically advocated very strongly uh, for using sums which were, uh, which ended up to be an eco economies of the budget to be directly to some of the services for key affected populations. So this could be an important step. In order to see those opportunities, one needs to look at quarterly budgetary quarterly reports. Well, quarterly reports are produced obviously by quarter, uh, whereas uh, for first report, first quarter report is an annual report. Uh, especially important part is mid-year report, because uh, during mid-year report, most of the tendering procedures would be already over, and government will starts to reprogram whatever economies or underspending or overspending they had in each of the lines. So this is a, an important aspect for intervention. 
another aspect of intervention is regulations uh, about public procurement. For example, when we want to advocate for social contracting, which, uh, which, which is a term which is used in our region to denote that uh, those services are purchased from uh, civil society organizations instead of public organizations, um, uh, this is something that needs to be uh, understood as a part of public procurement process. Uh, implementation documents are very important because, uh, as we said, uh, allocation for harm reduction, which just goes on printing leaflets, is not the, maybe a very best allocation. Um, now we can, as, a, as this process, we can influence technical specifications of procurements, like uh, QRs for tenders, basically. Um, and we can demand open tenders, review those tenders, review budgetary reports, review processes around social contracting, and one of the key which is put in bold here, uh, which is the strengths which community organizations have, we, could, we can do community monitoring. Uh, budget execution means that funds approved in a budget for certain beneficiaries go to, go to the, those beneficiaries. So by arguing that by, by monitoring whether those funds actually benefited the end user or not is, is a very important aspect of um, intervening in a budget execution process and is basically a strong, a strong side of community organizations because they have access to communities for, for which those services are available to. Uh, if we have advocated for opening of a center, let's say, a uh, facility harm reduction center somewhere in the region, and we see that it's July and there's no center there, um, you don't really, uh, this is just bare bone fact, fact that budget was not executed, implemented in a fashion, it was formulated and then uh, approved. Uh, and you don't really need for that any review of any complex documents, etc. So you don't really care whether public procurement in the law says that opening of the center is very complicated. You basically says this was a commitment of the save that this was a commitment of the government which was not implemented. So it's rather a it's rather a shortcut. Uh, to argue about s things about the budgeting, budget allocation, and also a strong point for community organizations because they have the best access and they, it's a, their strong point actually to collect this information. So it's uh, as what WHO has called an effective coverage. So just commitment of the coverage does not mean that actually people benefit it. So measuring effective coverage is something that is that could be done by community monitoring. And again, budget oversight and evaluation, which is a uh, last last step in this circular process, meaning that uh, this is not the end, but could be a start itself, um, is actually to enhance the quality and availability of cost uh, availability and cost effectiveness of the services. So again, the fact that we have a country has spent transparently we are open tender uh, 100,000 k which we advocated for harm reduction on printing leaflets the fact that it was not the most uh, cost effective way of delivering harm reduction services is something that could should and uh, could come up as a part of budget oversight and evaluation process mm. Uh, the uh, stakeholders in this working process is definitely government bodies as well as oversight bodies. So oversight bodies can be part of the executive branch of the government or could, could be outside of the executive branch of the government, depends on uh, how the system is set up in the country. Uh, international organizations are also are very much uh, interested to see the uh, reports about budget execution in terms of audit reports as well as shadow reports which could be produced by civil society 
organizations. Uh, uh, so all of those reports are important placeholders for our advocacy efforts. And uh, yes, tools for budget oversight and evaluation are various and now uh, those tools uh, uh, number of those tools already exists in many countries we just need to find appropriate placeholder for something that is important for us uh, uh, but the important part again here is community monitoring because this is something that could be done by community organizations effectively and actually show uh, effectiveness of any program so programs are designed for uh, any program has a beneficiary and those beneficiaries have to be clearly defined and the fact whether the program has reached beneficiary or not is very important uh, part of its evaluation of its oversight